This is The Causes of Things, and I'm your host, Michael O'Fallon. Okay, Boomer. It is a phrase that has been aimed at boomer-aged Americans as an ad hominem answer to dismiss the concerns of those middle-aged and older Americans that Millennials and Generation Z has used, somehow effectively, instead of rebutting objective answers from older Americans with an actual fact-based objective argument. It is the ultimate in cognitive laziness. You see, because the objective arguments are no longer in vogue in this new subjective world of fractured and fanciful epistemologies. By dismissing the facts-based arguments of men and women, with a considerable amount of life experience and knowledge behind them, the young, puppeted, moldable social justice warrior re-emphasizes their chosen path of discerning what truth is. A fractured, identity-laden, broken, age-related, race-related, gender-related shattering of glass on the proverbial kitchen floor that can only be understood by who, quote, wields the power, and the one who wields the power determines the, quote, truth, unquote. So the goal of the social justice-minded youth brigade and their subjective strategic commanders is not the pursuit of truth, but the conquest and pursuit of power. So, in the young social justice-minded individual, the old power, the old truth, must be replaced with the new power, and truth is no longer important, because it's all about power. And your power Boomer and Generation X, must be deconstructed, the tearing down of the old hierarchies. And the new power, the new postmodern state that guarantees to establish justice for all, must be erected in place of the generations of those that they are building their upside-down fake empire upon. So the current deconstructionists create an ideological revolution that opposes the current, modern, accepted paths of determining truth. So they must, at some point, lie. So to lie effectively and to create the continuance of their new subjective goals, they must invade the space occupied by education, by overtaking and controlling the spaces of didactic reasoning, and expel the old boomer ways of thinking. You must create fake scholarship. You must ideal launder false and misleading emotional arguments that cannot bear the scrutiny of observation and debate. You must create false and misleading history that deconstructs the factual historical record, like what we are witnessing with the fertile fallacy known as the 1619 Project, or the move to create new paths to mathematic understanding. The most important way of clearing intellectual space for fake scholarship and culture is to marginalize the concept of truth. Now, this may seem or look difficult at first. After all, in the halls of academia, every utterance, every discussion, seems to be aimed at truth by its very nature. Well, at least... That was the goal for you, Boomer, when you were in school. But, and here is a challenge, Boomer, how can knowledge come to us if we are indifferent to attempting to discern the truth of what we read? You see, it's far too simple. See, we from the previous generations were after the truth. We used to watch for hours, debates in person on television and text of men and women arguing points and demanding facts for claims. The most common phrase we used to use in our discussions and debates was, quote, what's your proof for that? End quote. But the new educators of the new social justice-oriented powers that be 
have created a new way of debating that disregards the truth of another's words, since its primary concern is not to derive the truth of those words, but to diagnose them, to discover where they are coming from, and to reveal the emotional, moral, and political attitudes that underlie a given choice of words or thoughts. Now, if we wind back the clock 150 years or so, we see that the habit of going behind your opponent's words stems from Karl Marx's theory of ideology, which tells us that in bourgeois conditions, concepts, habits of thought, and ways of seeing the world are adopted because of their socioeconomic function, not their truth. The idea of justice, for instance, which sees the world in terms of rights and responsibilities and assigns ownership and obligations across society, was dismissed by early Marxists as a piece of bourgeois ideology. The ideological purpose of the concept is to validate bourgeois relations of production, which from another perspective can be seen to violate the very requirements that the concept of justice lays down. So then, the concept of justice in the Marxist ethos is in conflict with itself and serves merely to mask a social reality that has to be understood in other terms, in terms of the powers to which people are subject rather than the rights that they claim. The Marxist theory of ideology is extremely contentious, not the least because it is tied to socioeconomic hypotheses that are no longer believable. However, it survived the enormous and right-minded criticism of Marxism in the 60s and 70s and is greatly apparent in postmodern neo-Marxist form in the work of French postmodernist Michel Foucault and other intellectuals, notably in The Order of Things, which was from 1966, and in his whimsical essays on the origins of the prison and the madhouse. Now, please note that Foucault is the most quoted and referred to philosopher in the social justice world, followed just behind by Jacques Derrida. Just this past week, for instance, I even saw that Foucault was quoted authoritatively in SBC Voices, a Southern Baptist blog. So with Foucault, you have exuberant exercises in rhetoric, full of paradoxes and historical fabrications, sweeping the reader along with a kind of facetious indifference to the standards of rational argument. That's what makes it postmodern in construct. Instead of an argument, Foucault sees discourse in the place of truth. He sees power. Instead of arguments, discourse. In other words, we're not trying to actually find the center of the truth. And in the place of truth, he sees nothing but power. In Foucault's view, all discourse gains acceptance by expressing, fortifying, and concealing the power of those who maintain it. And those who, from time to time, perceive this fact are invariably imprisoned as criminals or locked away as mad, a fate that Foucault himself unaccountably avoided. Foucault's approach reduces culture and settled knowledge to a power game, and scholarship to a kind of refereeing in the endless struggle between oppressed and oppressing groups. You can see this happening all over the place across our society now. Jordan Peterson refers to this as the Hobbesian battleground of competing power relationships that is only concerned about achieving power over the previous hegemonic oppressor as opposed to pursuing truth. Now, in the new Foucauldian philosophical community, if, quote, truth, end quote, is exchanged for power, then the only truth is power. And whatever is necessary to achieve power will establish your new but false truth, which is no truth at all, not even a shadow, of objective truth. It is a subjective fake, a distorted image or funhouse mirror of whatever mutated clone 
it has created of what was previously provable or actually real. The shift of emphasis from the content of utterance to the power that speaks through it leads to a new kind of scholarship, which is no scholarship at all, which bypasses entirely questions of truth and rationality, and can even reject those questions as themselves ideological. Now, the pragmatism of the late American philosopher Richard Rorty, which, again, I've mentioned this before, I do want to note that Richard Rorty was the grandson of Christian social justice pioneer Walter Rauschenbusch, is of similar effect. Rorty's ideas expressly set themselves against the idea of objective truth, giving a variety of arguments for thinking that truth is a negotiable thing, that what matters in the end is which side you are on. If a doctrine is useful in the struggle that liberates your group, then you are entitled to dismiss the alternatives. So we have set our future generations to public and postmodern Christian education. We have handed over their cognitive development to those who wish to sever their relationship with you, the old. I'm talking about you, boomer or Gen X parent. To sever their relationship with you, family traditions, church catechisms, and a greater, wider connection to objective understandings of history. To sever their understanding with what life is about. Family. Children. Bettering their civilization around them. Or in the case of Christians. Severing them from the never-changing ancient truths that we are bound to uphold. Out with the old. In with the new. The fake intellectual invites the younger generation to conspire in its own self-deception, to join in creating a vast landscape of a fantasy world, to tear down the hierarchy, and to obliterate the solid ground on which we stand, to fracture the ground that you, Boomer and Gen Xer, have invested your time and treasure to preserve. Yes, those educational and theological institutions that took your boomer and Gen X revenue, promising to, quote, preserve the truth for future generations, end quote, but instead are fully involved in leading the young in our society and in our churches towards the new cultural and philosophical revolution where they will secure control and seize the power. So again, everything is fake. The fake professor or pastor is the teacher of genius to the brilliant young pupil. Fake in the sense that he is not teaching truth anymore, but only truth as understood through power. Faking now becomes a social activity in which people act together to draw a veil over unwanted realities and encourage each other in the exercise of their illusionary powers, fertile fallacies, put in place into the middle of reflexivity. Defending the mythical, demanding adherence to a new postmodern orthodoxy. The arrival of fake thought and fake scholarship in our universities, research institutions, and seminaries, therefore, should be attributed to an explicit desire to deceive 
It has come about through the complicit opening of territory to the propagation of nonsense. Nonsense of this kind is a bid to be accepted. It demands for the response. Kneel at the altar of metaphysical subjectivism. Kneel at the fake altar. America is in crisis. From the university, to the workplace, to the church. So in today's halls of education, it is quite a bit different than it was for you, truth-pursuing boomers. Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Milton? Oppressive. Algebra, geometry, and calculus. Oppressive. Current medical protocols and scientific methods? Oppressive, racist, colonial, problematic. The Christian understanding of the how to understand and put into practice the words of Scripture. Patriarchal, misogynistic, racist, colonial, oppressive, and once again, problematic. Everything is problematized. How about that American history you boomers and Generation Xers learned when you were in school? It's all tyranny. Professors correcting grammar and spelling or employers hiring by merit. Racist. Misogynistic. Oppressive. And the answer to these ills is always the same. Diversity. Inclusion. And equity. Whenever you see these things present, you know that they've bought into the new postmodern system. So students emerge into the working world believing that human beings are defined by their skin color, gender, and sexual preference, and that oppression based on these characteristics is the American experience. Speech that challenges these campus orthodoxies is silenced with brute force. Because to them, that correct truth-seeking speech is trauma. That is why the younger generation can't engage you. That is why they dismiss your pleas for sanity with, Okay, boomer. The root of this problem is the belief in America's endemic racism and sexism a belief that has engendered a metastasizing diversity bureaucracy in society, academia, and the church. Diversity commissars denounce meritocratic standards as discriminatory, enforce hiring quotas and diversity and equity, and teach students and adults alike to think of themselves as perpetual victims. From the hashtag MeToo mania, that blurs normal male and female flirtations and instead compares the normal courtship process with criminal acts to implicit bias and diversity compliance training that sees racism in every interaction. We are creating a fractured nation of narrowed minds primed for grievance and that we are putting our competitive edge with other nations at great risk. The social justice-minded youth don't know how to think. They don't know what truth really is. Again, they confuse it all with power. But there is a generation that was trained in years past to pursue objective truth, to use the scientific method, logic, reason, or their handmaidens. There is a generation that knows that scientific biology and the reality of sexes, two of them, is something we had better get a hold of quickly or we will lose all of the possibility of family in the future. 
There is a generation that made sacrifices to pursue eternal truths, provable truths that would be passed on to future generations. It's your turn. You can't be silent. You can't dismiss all of this as they're just being kids. That's not what's going on. Okay, Boomer. What are you going to do about it? And if you are a young person listening to this program and want a truly fulfilling life, I suggest humbly breaking from your current tribe with an understanding that someone has endured a lot more life than you have. The searing pain of loss of a loved one. The victory of achievement and hard work and perseverance. And who knows that the pursuit of real truth, objective truth, truth that you can know is vastly more important than whatever cause du jour your masters have pushed you into. Maybe, young woman, as Camille Paglia has stated, maybe you will be able to see that girls who are indoctrinated in this social justice nonsense to see men not as equals and not as protectors, but as oppressors and rapists, are condemned to remain in a permanently juvenile condition for life. If you do go this route, you have surrendered your own personal agency to a poisonous creed that claims to empower women, but has ended by infantilizing them. Similarly, young men, you will have no motivation to mature if your potential romantic partners remain emotionally insecure, fragile, and fearful, forever looking to a parental proxy like campus grievance committees or governmental regulators to make the world safe for them. You need to be men. Men that will rise to defeat the enemy, defend their family, and provide for their family. To look in the eyes of your bride and to make a lifelong commitment of, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, till death do us part. See, if you lose this, you will lose what it means to be a man. You will die in your beds years from now, frail, unfulfilled, and as someone who was puppeted into being half a man. Don't let them rip this joy, this responsibility that you were made for from you. It's in your DNA. This is all frightfully dangerous. We are destroying the human condition in our schools and in our society, and possibly even worse, it's happening in our churches. With the duplicate of the hashtag Me Too movement, the hashtag Church Too movement. Maybe it's time for you, young person, to experience the joy, the sadness, and the inexplicable pleasure and purpose found in traditional marriage. The real challenge of a male and female relationship. Maybe it's time to break from the victim cycle. Pursue the wild adventure that is real, traditional, civilizational life. Maybe, young person, it's time to break with the pastor who had new ideas about social justice and tearing down the hierarchy. And maybe it's time to return to a historical and orthodox understanding of the faith. Maybe the new effeminate Jesus that they have led you to to embrace 
is not the savior at all, but a cheap plastic substitute for the sovereign Lord of the universe. Maybe, just maybe, young person, it's time for you to go to an older person that you respect, an older person who appears to get it when it comes to these things and say, Okay, Boomer, will you help to mentor me? Will you help me straighten out and erase this programming that those that seek to have me be a revolutionary tool in their quest for power against civilization? Can you help me understand how to have real relationships, to have real friends, and to have a real and substantial life? And now, Boomer, I'm looking at you. Okay, Boomer. Are you ready to step up to the plate? This younger generation needs you. Maybe it's time that you spend a little less time on you and invest your time in them. We've let them separate us demographically like this. Don't let this happen. This is your time, Boomer. You were made for this. It's your turn. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been The Causes of Things.